Welcome back. We uh, delayed 15 minutes to make up for the pre-lunch delay, uh, so we're now hoping to be on time again. I'm very pleased uh, today to be uh, moderating a panel with uh, three colleagues uh, who you'll know. Uh, I'm going to go straight into the discussion because we've only got one hour, um, so I'm going to use the time to the maximum. And I'm going to turn first to Michelle Dunn um, and to kick off, and then I'm going to go around with a number of questions and then come to you in the same format we've been following. Um, Michelle, Egypt, I'm going to start with that. Uh, there is a common thread here in that each of the countries we're looking at or that I, I want to spring on you um, lead back to the Gulf in one way or the other, so I, I do hope to be weaving that into our discussion. But I, I want to start with something very domestic, and that's Egypt's coming presidential election. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in Egypt. There's a, a mounting insurgency in Sinai. After four years, the Egyptian armed forces basically are failing to deal with it effectively. Uh, one can say a lot about it. You recently testified on the Hill in DC uh, about human rights and what the US should do about that. But then if we turn to the economy, there have been signs of improvement, of recovery and growth. Uh, foreign reserves are now back at their highest level for several years. And at the same time, however, it's clear that productivity is low in any sectors outside of real estate and energy. Um, and investment is also very low in those other non-oil, non-real estate sectors. So we're getting very mixed signals in a way, both on the economic front, on the security front, there seem to be increasingly draconian efforts to block political discussion of any kind anywhere with the recent uh, laws passed dealing with youth clubs, for instance, and universities. So, you know, does Sisi's second term offer anything new on any of this? Or is this the term that will sort of lead Egypt into some bigger crisis that we can't quite, I don't know, that I, I find difficult to, to, to imagine, to visualize? Uh, and I, thank you, Yazid, and I'm, I'm really happy to be with uh, you and all my colleagues from Carnegie from around the world uh, today. Look, I do think that 2018 is going to be a very challenging year for Egypt uh, and for President Abdel Fattah Sisi for several reasons, and you've, I, you've mentioned uh, three of them, uh, and I'll, I'm going to add another one, which is a potential water crisis. So, yes, on the economy, and that's kind of at the base of everything, what we've seen happen is that President Sisi has taken austerity measures uh, that the IMF and others have long urged him to do, notably floating the Egyptian currency and, uh, and other steps, cutting back energy subsidies and so forth. And these have, have gotten the Egyptian fiscal position uh, to be a bit improved. Now, let's not exaggerate it. It still means that Egypt needs billions of dollars of external financing, much of which comes from the Gulf as well as from the IMF and uh, a few other parties every year. But, it, but at least it has sort of driven the wolf from the door in terms of the Egyptian fiscal situation. What it hasn't done yet really is generate a lot of growth or a lot of additional employment. And uh, there are reasons for that. I, I think there are flaws in CC's economic policies um, and uh, that, that this, this focus on mega projects and so forth uh, driven by the state, still a lot of um, constraints on the private sector and uh, a very big role for the military and military companies in the economy, something that you've, you've written a lot about, Yazid. So the economic situation, I think, in 2018 is going to continue to be quite challenging. Egypt's going to continue to have high uh, inflation and high unemployment, and that, that adds up to a pretty big misery index for the Egyptian population. And, um, you know, we don't know if at some point that could become politically destabilizing. Then there's the, the security issue. You mentioned there is this insurgency, and it's, um, it's in the Sinai. It's not only in the Sinai. There are increasing number of uh, cells of terrorist organizations in the Nile Valley as well. 
And increasingly, these groups are carrying out attacks not only against Egyptian police and army officers, but civilians, as we've seen with the uh, Rauda mosque attack, as well as attacks on churches and so forth. So this, yeah, it, there's, there's no end in sight for this. And increasingly, I think there's a, a good bit of criticism um, domestically and internationally of the kind of scorched earth tactics that the uh, Egyptian state has been using against the insurgencies. And it seems that they, they just are not able to get the cooperation of enough of the population that they really need to defeat this. And then I mentioned briefly the, the uh, Nile water issue. Um, of course, Ethiopia is, is building the Renaissance Dam and it's more than halfway complete. It will be completed within the next year or two. And uh, that could, it, it could really diminish the Nile flow to Egypt. We can discuss that, the particulars of that more. But this is a, a, a significant issue that Egypt's been unable to resolve diplomatically. They're really at a diplomatic disadvantage against Ethiopia. All of these things add up, I think, to uh, a tough year for Sisi. He's at ending his first term and supposed to undergo a re-election bid. And what we saw recently was, uh, over the space of only a couple of weeks, no fewer than four uh, candidates, and I would say at least three of them credible candidates, uh, said they, they wanted to run against Sisi. And I think that was because they, they saw him as weakened. Um, it weakened politically and, and possibly vulnerable. I still think it's unlikely that there would really be a competitive election in Egypt next year. It's a, very much a climate of political repression as well as human rights abuses and not one in which there would be a, a democratic and competitive election. But there's a lot of speculation now in Egypt um, as to um, whether whether Sisi will make it s successfully to re-election. It's probably still the most likely thing to happen, but um, but there's you know there's a lot of talk about other possibilities as well. Thanks, but I mean I, I want to push that a bit further and go beyond sort of the immediate question, I guess, of whether Sisi will win or not, to what it's going to be like for any successful candidate to the presidency in the coming four or five years, given. For instance, to pick up on one of the statistics last year, according to the government uh, central agency for population mobilization statistics, CAPMAS, something like 28% of the entire population was in abject poverty. And generally, um, most, most experts and most uh, international agencies believe that poverty in Egypt is at 50%. And that's besides illiteracy and so on. So we're talking about massively problematic structural uh, realities. Uh, the population has gone over 100 million now. Um, and I guess what I'm sort of pushing for, I'll put it very crudely, is is this um, a country that's sort of in chronic crisis, but that'll keep muddling on with a bit of aid here and a bit of you know, more loans there? Or is this another country that's going to go into deep crisis in the Middle East? It might not look like Syria or Libya, but do you see it going into something into a terrain we, we just don't recognize at all. Look, that, that type of thing is always very hard to predict. It's very difficult to predict when um, extremely difficult economic or security or other circumstances would translate into political instability. But, um, you know, Egyptians themselves talk about the possibility of state failure a lot more than they used to. All right, and, and um, some, of this, some of these are long-running problems. Uh, there's a, a huge problem in Egypt, a huge gap of, um, of human development, uh, as well as of um, you know, environmental and resource problems, especially the water problem. That you know, you know that at, at some point these things are going to become uh, massive crises, and of you know, rapid population growth that that continues in the face of all of this. So there, there are a lot of ingredients here that could um, you know add up to actual instability, and I think that's one of the things that drives a lot of the policies we see towards Egypt, whether it's from the Gulf, whether it's from the United States or Europe, is the fear of massive instability in Egypt that could lead to uh, large-scale migration, 
toward Europe, or, um, or uh, of course, Egypt has a very serious domestic terrorism problem, but could that become a terrorism problem that overflows the borders you know, into other countries? So there's a lot of worry for that, and I think there's a lot of, sometimes there's support for President Sisi, even though there's a lot of doubt about whether his policies are, are really working, whether he's addressing these challenges effectively, but um, with the, because of the repression, there were so few other political alternatives, and I think you know a number of international players and so forth end up giving him more or less unqualified support because they just they they fear uh, a vacuum or or state failure. Um, Most of I want to move to another very big crisis, obviously on every level, a massive humanitarian crisis, but also one of one of yet another Arab state uh, in, in failure, in this case more actual than, than possible or potential, and that's Yemen, of course. And I'm going to lead with an obvious question, uh, you know, in the wake of Saleh's uh, assassination. Now, clearly, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia succeeded in peeling Saleh away from the Houthi alliance just before his death. I mean, that was obviously the trigger for his death. and. So they, they may achieved a certain success, but they're still very much bogged down in a war they started. And it's also very clear, I think it's been clear from early on in the war, that the Emirates and, the Saudi, and Saudi Arabia have actually rather different approaches in Yemen. I mean, how they actually operate on the ground, militarily, in terms of um, trying to find local allies, proxies, and so on, their relationships, say, with the Hadi government versus with other actors. There have been in a way, more differences than agreement, almost, between those two allies. So where does Saleh's death place them? I mean, do they now have a viable strategy, since basically the Houthis have kidnapped that, they've taken it away by killing Saleh? Is maybe Ahmed Saleh still a viable alternative? Where do you see the politics of this unfolding? Um, and bottom line is, do the Saudis and the Emiratis have somehow still some hope of uh, a political exit from this? Unfortunately, since day one of this war, there has been no strategy. I mean, it was very obvious because the, um, the, uh, the coalition led by Saudi Arabia when they started this air campaign, they were under the impression that it will, be end, uh, that it will end within two, three months. And we have to re remember that at the beginning, they had no local allies on the ground. So they only depended on their campaign. And when they started to assemble the alliance or allies within the, in, the, uh, in the country, it was too late. Because Houthis were already spreading their forces until they reached the south, until Aden, and they reached even in Abyan, Shabwa, Taiz. So it was very hard to, uh, to regain the momentum of their campaign. Uh, the second point is that the Emiratis had no experience in dealing with Yemeni politics, with Yemeni domestic politics. It was for them something like uh, they came just to support the Saudis, who apparently lost their uh, influence in Yemen during the last two, 10 years of Saleh. And that made the Emiratis a bit confused, a bit uncertain of what the second step they should take. And we have also to remember the uh, strike that hit the, Saudi, the Emirati uh, military in Marib in 2015, where they had 54 of their uh, soldiers killed. And this is a huge number for um, an army like the uh, Emirati army. That made them feel that they should not work in the north. So they started concentrating on the south. And again, there on the south, they were faced by different players that they did not know. That created more havoc, more uh, vacuum in the south, and this is what we witness now in Aden, that with all the uh, presence of the Sudani forces, of the Emirati forces, of uh, local allies in, in Aden, they were not able to stabilize the place. Now, the, uh, with Saleh absence from the scene, if we go to that part now of the story, it might lead to two options that the Saudis and the Emiratis must face now, and the international community. We have one player in town, and although they do not have the, uh, the support of the majority of the population, but they are the, the, 
the hardest force, the strong force, in, uh, the strong power in, uh, on the ground. So when any negotiate, negotiations call are summoned by the United Nations, the Houthis will be the only representatives of the North. There is no, no and this is, this is what Saleh's absence has created. He was a pragmatic guy. He was never a man of ideology or a man who has principles and values that he would stick to. He was very flexible, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say that even his, his shift to disengage from Houthis on December 2nd was a surprise to us who know the Yemeni politics, because it, for me, Saleh is a guy who really calculates his steps. He would never take a, uh, any decision without knowing what the repercussions would be. Why did he take it? Did he have pledges that you, they, somebody will come to his support? Did he think that the tribes around Sana'a would support him and defend him? So I, I, now when we see things in retrospect, we will see that he failed in, in assessing the realities on the ground and what happened during the last three years where Houthis were already the real power. Because Saleh has lost his military powers in 2014 when uh, the Houthis ran in, in Sana'a and took all his equipment from the, from the Republican Guard. So again, I think we will, or I wish that we will witness peace negotiations, but sadly on the other side, you will have only to negotiate with Houthis who do not know the uh, complexities of regional uh, politics, of international politics, and it's very shocking that yesterday when the Russians decided to shut down their uh, embassy and uh, evacuate all their diplomats, it was faced by Houthis claiming that that was a victory for them. And that sh this shows how absent they are or absent-minded from the realities on the ground. But to answer finally your question now about Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, definitely they have two different approaches. This is very clear, and, uh, but we all know that the Emiratis will never relinquish their support to the Saudis, and this is the dilemma where both sides are uh, trying to, to solve, but I don't think it will be uh, something that we will see an end to it. This, I mean, I, this, this goes way beyond 2018 in a way, but um, to some extent, um, my reading of the, the failure of the Yemeni transition after 2011 is that too many of the same players were still playing the game. I mean, you had Saleh and his sons and nephew and so on. You had uh, Hadi, in a sense, still playing that game, Ali, Ali Muhsin, and the Houthis. I mean, there wasn't enough real change in the political map of Yemen. And I almost feel as if after you know, two and a half years of a terrible war, we're still playing with the same political map. Were there to be peace tomorrow, were somehow you know, the Saudis and Emiratis to make peace with the Houthis or to bring Ahmed Salah in and replace Hadi with him, for instance, any, any scenario you like, are we, are we looking at the recreation of the P2011 Yemen yet again? Is that actually, or, or are we looking at something that won't even reach that level of semi-stability? What's that your reading of today's sorry. trends? Uh, that, that sort of. I think as Yemeni, I must admit that Yemen has been, uh, during the last three years, reached the status of not a failed state, but a fragmented state, that no power can get these pieces together. And this is the, uh, the concerns and the worries that will be reflected on, these, on the Saudis, mostly on the Saudis because of the borders and on the security of the Red Sea. Uh, going back to 2011, I don't think Yemenis have the appetite to go back there, and no, no, powers are, sorry, no powers are on the ground. On the ground now we have the Houthis, we have the Muslim brothers who are represented by Islah, you have the Salafists, you have members of Al-Qaeda and IS, you have some jihadists, but there is no real central force that's really, uh, uh, belonging to the state, to Hadi. He is the weakest link in the whole game now. And all these guys have created an, a new economy of wars that's, that we all witness in, when the wars go for a long time. And their interests now 
have gone beyond their will and desire to reach an agreement, none of these players is willing to concede or to give concessions or make compromises. It's either me or not you. So this is where we are now. I, and then the only country that I would call that can make Houthis rethink would be Iran regionally or Oman. And these two countries are absent from the whole equation. Now we claim that the Iranians are, have an influence on the Houthis. If this is the case, we should talk to them. And Oman, as an, in, uh, if I might say, an independent or a neutral power in the region, they can also talk to Houthis because they are the only access for Houthis to move out of Yemen. They cannot, there is no other borders where they can cross and leave the country. So would the Saudis and the Emiratis reach an agreement that this is the right moment to talk to Houthis? And would the Houthis themselves feel that this is the right moment for them, for them to get the legitimacy for their group after doing the, uh, after disengaging with Saleh and his uh, party? I think Personally, I think this is where we are going to go, that the Houthis will be the representative in any negotiations for the North. It will not be accepted by Islam and Hadi, but this is the only way out. And this leaves us with a rather interesting situation where we have several countries, I mean, we've discussed Egypt and Yemen just now, where the, the sources and the scale of their problems um, are beyond the power of any outside government or group of governments, whether it's the EU, the US, uh, the GCC states, to fix. And at the same time, these are countries which are not going to go back to 2011 or 2013 or whichever it is. And so, and if you broaden that picture, and I'm, I'm, I want to come to you, Joe, with this question that um, I'm looking at this from the GCC point of view, or what's left of it, and in particular, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, that you've got Iraq, Syria, Yemen and Libya, for at least, which are not going back to where they once were, where a solution seems to be beyond the will and ability of any coalition of outside powers to uh, change fundamentally and put back on some sort of more peaceful track. We've got countries like Egypt, which are a huge drain and demand on resources that even the Europeans or the US find it difficult to provide anymore, or the GCC for that matter. So from a GCC perspective, this must look like a very threatening regional environment. Um, Lebanon's not much better. Uh, they're, they're, you know, working, as we saw just last month, working out whether they can get back at Iran through Lebanon or not and finding the limits of their power. Uh, Trump's uh, uh, recognition of Israel as the capital, uh, or recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And, and all these are challenges and demands being thrown at the big players in the Gulf. So, you know, if you're in their shoes, what would you do? Is there a way out? I, I surely won't answer the last question. <laughs> uh, but first of all, let me say that, I mean, a word of gratitude and pleasure to be here and, and really congrats to Maha and the team in Beirut for this wonderful conference, the second year in a row. Um, look, the way you, uh, you, you pose, you, you, you put the question on the table is, is by itself interesting because it mixes uh, a lot of levels. It mixes a regional level, the intra-GCC, power play and, and architecture. Uh, some domestic issues also, I think that the domestic transformation in Saudi Arabia is a, is a huge parameter to factor in this, uh, this equation. And then the relation between this complex, which is the GCC and the external world, and uh, the US and, and other threats and etc. What's interesting, and uh, maybe it's a way of answering your question, is to see that at the three levels, we are in a situation of incredible flux and volatility and uncertainty. So in fact, both three parameters are, are moving today. Let me take them very briefly one by one. On the, on the Gulf level, on the inter-Gulf or intra-Gulf structure or relation, you have something that you already alluded to uh, in all the intervention and you yourself in your introduction now, you have a kind of um, increasing convergence between um, the 
Saudi Arabia and the Arab United Emirates with a kind of, although it's difficult to inquire and to really depict, with a kind of mentorship by the small one towards the big one. Meaning that, in fact, on many levels, uh, Yemen is one, and, and probably on other levels you can say so, you have a kind of mentorship from the Arab Emirates towards Saudi Arabia, and maybe a personal mentorship from uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed towards uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. This is some, something. On the other level, you have the end of the GCC as we knew it, and I think it was completely enacted a few days ago when you had this announcement that uh, the two twins, the Saudis and the Emiratis, are forming a new axis, a new alliance. And uh, another elusive axis that is being formed between Oman and Qatar that have independent foreign policies, sometimes uh, closer to Iran, and Kuwait, which is uh, in a, bit, a bit in the middle. So this is on the, on the regional level. On the domestic level, you have another flux and volatility and uncertainty with what we mentioned this morning. I mean, the Saudi enormous reshuffling. I think it's not exaggerated to say, although we can't prejudge the conclusions and the results, that Saudi Arabia is today uh, in, into a kind of enormous mutation of its DNA. I mean, we all know the three pillars of, of the Saudi kingdom are almost eroded today, family, oil rent, and the religious establishment or, or Wahhabism. Now, what will this lead towards, we don't know. Now, some people, the, optimist, the optimists in the room or in the world would say, this is something uh, necessary, MBS is doing the right thing, but on the dark side or on the downside, you have something very risky, a rise of authoritarianism, but mainly a rise of adventurism regionally and, and, and towards uh, the, the neighbors. Last but not least, the, the, the international level, this complex of GCC, which is in a kind, let me put it this way, of triangle between the US, Israel, and Iran. This is, this is today the way to look at it. Now, some questions were put on the table this morning, uh, mainly by Jared Blanc, when he said, we don't know exactly what's the personal diplomatic relation between the US and, and Saudi Arabia. I still don't know what is exactly uh, heard by Riyadh when it talks to the US. Uh, is Riyadh reading correctly the signs that are sent to it by Washington? Is it misreading them, overreading them? I think Yemen was an example, Lebanon was an example. I think it was very clear that it's, it misread them. And uh, 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 I mean, last but not least, you have this, this amazingly interesting convergence today between Israel and the two, and the two states, and Saudis and, and Emiratis, that is in fact probably enlightening somewhere and somehow the Jerusalem decision, but also at the same, same time sending signals uh, towards a new conflictuality uh, against Iran. So if we take all this together, in fact, we have an amazing number of unknowns and of fluctuant parameters that, in fact, of course, indicate that something in the Gulf architecture is over and almost dead. Uh, a mutation in the internal and domestic DNAs of this country, and I think the, road, the, the oil rent thing is something that is boding over or, or, or hovering over all this. Uh, and you have this international uncertainty. I haven't mentioned Russia, of course, because we have no time, but you have this amazing uncertainty internationally that uh, probably could lead us more towards a series of conflictualities than a series of arrangements and, and solutions. Thanks. I, I want to throw in a couple of very quick questions before opening up to the floor so we've got an, a good amount of time for a wider discussion. But maybe, Joe, you could respond. I mean, Mustafa was starting to say that what we're, we haven't discussed yet, and I'd like you maybe to th reflect on a bit, is the reverse effects of the Yemen conflict or others internally within Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. I mean, we tend to think of these as these powerful, rich countries affecting you know, a poor country like Yemen. Uh, but Yemen and Saudi Arabia in particular have had such intimate historical relations on every level forever um, that the idea that Saudi Arabia is somehow immune from the long-term effects of what happens in Yemen. And I wonder if you could uh, pick up on that particular idea and maybe tie it to some of the other things you were saying. On that level, um, uh, I would probably tie it to, uh, without, without I mean, being tempted to over-exaggerate in the analysis, but I would tie it to the, let's say, the, 
the power construction of, of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. I think that, I mean, whenever I talk about this with uh, Saudi experts or uh, observers of the region, there's a consensus to say that a certain level of conflictuality, of tension in the region, and Yemen is one case, is um, probably a necessary resource in the uh, power building, in the power consolidation of Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, when you talk to, sometimes even to Saudi officials, they will admit uh, more or less clearly that there's something in political science that you know more, more than us very well, which is uh, war-making state building. I mean, the relation between tension, war-making, construction of nationalism or patriotism and state building. I think there's something like that in the Saudi mind today towards the region. This is why I think that not only due to geopolitical, uh, let's say, dynamics, conflictuality is maybe more probable than something else, but I think that it's a, it's a willing, more or less well-thought strategy of power consolidation. So my fear is that, uh, at least for that reason, uh, we won't see a winding down of, of tensions. It applies to Yemen because I don't think that uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman can, as you said, Mr. Minister, negotiate anything before having at least a partial symbolic or strong victory. With Qatar, I don't see things uh, winding down. And in Lebanon, I don't think that the Saudis have completely or at least uh, not even completely at all, quote unquote, swallowed uh, the kind of setback that they lived the last months, and we've heard uh, Prime Minister Hari this morning talking about that. So I think that a lot has to do with this power construction and power consolidation that is in fact a structural issue with Saudi Arabia that has to do with succession, a question that in fact was put on the shelf uh, during decades in the history of the kingdom, but is today uh, fully open on the table with the end of the first generation. You lead straight into the other question I had in mind, which I'm, I want to put to all three of you, um, and it's slightly composite. On the one side, it's clear that the Saudis in particular and others, as we saw last month in Lebanon with the whole issue of the Prime Minister's resignation from Riyadh, and that there's a certain reading of U.S. intentions and policy and what sort of support these countries are getting from the White House. And I think the Saudis made certain assumptions, acted on them in the case of last month's uh, Lebanese crisis. Um, it's clear that over the last two and a half years, the Saudis and the Emiratis, of course, have made similar assumptions about what US policy allows or doesn't allow, where the red lines are, if any. Um, and the same, I think, happens with Egypt, that Egypt, uh, Sisi, and the system around him have, you know, always are very, always have an eye on Washington. They don't always accept publicly or even privately what Washington wants. Sometimes they push back, but they always have a very careful reading of what they think they can push back on and when and why and how. But so the three, in, in all three cases, we have these, these political leaders carefully watching Washington at a time when, as we heard this morning, first thing from Liz Dribble that you know, everyone in Washington is watching, watching Washington, trying to, trying to find out what the White House wants to do and what it's really thinking. So I guess the, the real question is, last month the Saudis seem to have miscalculated, misread Washington because they read what the White House wanted, but then Tillerson, Mattis and others pushed back very hard and very publicly, I think embarrassingly publicly, to defend Lebanon from a crisis. What if Sisi of the Sisi's of the world or on Yemen, similar miscalculations happen or the Trump administration finally goes, you know, and if not straight away, then of course in three years, um, where are these actors left? You know, where, where does Sisi find himself if the US takes a different tack once again or he's misreading? What happens with the Saudis? What happens in Yemen? So if you were to take a minute each or a minute and a half each, let's, let's have a final round and come to the audience. There is that uh, it falls within the uh, culture and the Gulf, that it's personal relations that create policy, that build policies. They did not understand that DC and the other uh, Western capitals are more complicated than just personal relations between Jared Kushner and uh, MBS. It, it goes beyond that. And they built all their hopes and their aspirations within in, uh, Washington upon these personal, uh, personal 
contacts. We saw J uh, Jared Kushner in Riyadh in a secret mission that we did not know until he left. What did he do? What he, did he discuss? We don't know. But again, it's the culture of MBS he ha who has not built yet an institution that will take a decision and that will study it and reflect on it. He's just, okay, I'm a friend with Jared. Jared is influential on Trump. But could they not realize that Washington is much more sophisticated than just talking to Trump and his, uh, the White House. Do you see the same problem, Michelle? Well, look, yes, I think there are, there are plenty of miscalculations going on in this very dynamic situation. I mean, you mentioned Saudi miscalculations in a number of situations. I think they had one toward Egypt as well. I think, uh, you know, basically compelling Sisi to give them the islands of Tehran and Senafir. Um, I think they've damaged CC that way. And this is, you know, I, I, I have no position on the, on the historic or, or legal aspects of this, whether those islands really belong to Saudi Arabia or not, quite apart from that politically. And I think even in terms of inside the Egyptian military, this is a source of resentment, uh, both towards Saudi Arabia and towards CC. So I think that was, in my view, a miscalculation on their part. I also do think there are Egyptian miscalculations regarding the United States. Part of it's related to what M with Mustafa just said. Um, you know, the United States, we still are uh, a state of institutions, and um, the Congress plays a very important role, and certainly it plays a very important role in any kinds of um, foreign assistance, military assistance. It controls the purse strings and so forth. And uh, I think Sisi had a bad surprise after he had a very warm visit with President Trump in Washington and then had his military assistance, uh, uh, some of it cut back and some of it suspended based on several concerns related to Egyptian military cooper cooperation with North Korea as well as a, a really uh, harsh campaign against civil society and NGOs inside of Egypt. And I, you know, I, I think uh, it, was, it was a misreading, you know, that, that just that President Trump himself would somehow dictate everything in American policy. That's, it's clearly not true, partly because we have institutions and checks and balances, and partly because I think President Trump himself doesn't necessarily take a strong interest or a strong position on all of these issues and he's he's content in some cases to to let others play their role and so um, there's a lot of experimentation going on here and uh, the, the last thing I wanted to say about this is look a country like Egypt that is as economically dependent as they are uh, are you know they're going to continue to be ha they're really having to CC is having to dance pretty fast to try to balance off um, the United States and Russia, the United States and North Korea, um, Saudi Arabia and his domestic audience and so forth, you know, and we see him testing a lot of these relationships to see, you know, and, and himself, I think, in many cases, miscalculating in terms of what will, what will work inside his own country, whether it's against terrorism or in favor of the economy, and what will go over reasonably well, both with the domestic audience as well as his foreign sponsors. Joe. Very quickly on that, because you said, I mean, you, you, um, you unpacked the two examples of Yemen and Lebanon, but I think another very interesting example is Qatar, is the crisis with Qatar. I mean, it's very striking to see that the, the crisis with Qatar erupted very quickly after the Riyadh summit. I mean, uh, President Trump left Riyadh uh, at day one, and uh, the, the, the Qatar crisis erupted at day five. And I'm sure, and I think it's now well, well illustrated, that the Saudis were really thinking that they had the full support of Washington in that crisis, and that probably uh, Amir Tamim from Qatar would be uh, outseated or, or, or uh, I mean, there would be a kind of regime change in Doha in the, in the weeks to come. And we are now six months after the crisis and this crisis is still open. It is still open in a context where you have until lately, last week, a president of the Republic in the US who is saying in some tweets that Qatar is a founder of terror, while at the same time his minister of defense and his foreign minister are openly saying, like uh, Minister Tillerson in, in Paris last week, that he calls on Saudi Arabia for greater moderation towards Yemen, Qatar, and Lebanon, which is also very interesting. So this is the personal, let's say, diplomatic side which, which we talked about. 
The thing that more profoundly than that, what I, what I perceive from Riyadh and, and the Emirates probably, is that they see, and this is where also they probably oversee or overread or misread, uh, that there's a very uh, short window of opportunity today that they would like to make the biggest benefit of, which is uh, the post-Obama anti-Iranian feeling in Washington and uh, the rise of the Iranian perceived threat by Israel. They feel that this is a window of opportunity that will not come twice and that they have to make uh, the hugest benefit uh, of. Uh, immediately in the, in the coming. It's not a coincidence also that all this comes at a time where the entire world and the US at their forefront is announcing that the battle with ISIS is over and now the new threat in the region is Iran, in Syria Iraq. And I agree with Liz Dibble this morning that this is only talk because so far we don't see anything on the theaters of Iraq and Syria to curb Iran. So I think that beyond the purely anecdotal, quote unquote, because it's not anecdotal, uh, 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 personal thing between, I mean, what happens between people in the White House and the family of Trump and, and MBS and his coterie, I think that there is a structural explanation that there's something today, there's a low-hanging fruit today, and we have, we have to seize it. Last but not least, I think that it's not the first time, and, and this is something known in international relations, that small actors uh, can sometimes expect and sometimes can succeed in drawing, in, in trapping big powers into some regional conflicts. It's not the first time it happens. I'm not sure it won't happen with the US, but I'm almost sure that it won't happen with Israel this time. Mm. Thanks, well, I'm going to open it up now for quick questions. Uh, again, please raise your hand if you want the microphone, introduce yourself and give us a very Precise, concise question. There's a microphone there, please, and anyone else, let me know. Uh, my name is Visham Thursley from Lebanon. I have a question. Uh, what do you think about uh, the chances of success of MBS? Uh, history in the past has not been very kind to uh, uh, people like MBS. Do you think he will be an exception and he will succeed in his reforms in, uh, in Saudi Arabia? Do I have a volunteer to take this? I mean, this is typically the kind of question that we, we would avoid in a way or another. I would say that I, I said it very quickly. I can, I, can, I can maybe develop this idea. I mean, uh, look, uh, put aside the personal equations and et cetera, but I think that structurally, what probably what could help Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is succeeding is uh, the fact that the f even the family that is suffering today from his venture, uh, sometimes physically, I mean, they are trapped in a, in a, in, in a basement in a hotel, but uh, even them are acknowledging that the system has reached its uh, logical limit, that it can't go on and that it has to be maybe harshly reformed or changed and etc. Now, what doesn't plea for, and, and the second thing, of course, is the, is the rent issue and the, the end of the rent era and the necessity of going to a more rational uh, economy and et cetera, which is Vision 2030 and et cetera. What doesn't help that is that it's always very uh, difficult not only to change a system. I mean, you have a lot of examples, Gorbachev or et cetera. I think that you were alluding maybe to King Faisal, I don't know. But uh, what is more difficult in that case is that you are at the same time either breaking or they are broken by themselves the three main pillars of legitimacy of, of this kingdom since its inception. I mean, the nexus between uh, religion and the sword, I mean, the, the pact between Abdul Aziz and, and Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, uh, the rent uh, system, which is in fact at the base of the entire political economy of the country and maybe the social engineering of the country. And last but not least, this in fact, the political party that holds Saudi Arabia, which is the royal family. I mean, there is a political party in Saudi Arabia, which is the royal family. So when you break all this, uh, you are putting all the odds against you, although the same system acknowledges that the limit has been reached and it has to be, uh, to be changed. So of course, I don't have a an answer to your question, but these are the parameters, I, th I think. And this bet is really, really very risky. And on top of that, if you add on this, 
the regional very volatile situation and the elusive U.S. support to that, as we said, that uh, probably won't overlast uh, President Trump's presidency. Thanks. I've got a question right over there. Um, microphone. Sorry. Yeah. First, please. Shusma. Well, okay. Then I'll come back to there. Uh, you need to hold up the mic, please. Lights on, but you need to hold it closer to your mouth. بخصوص عملية أن الحوثيين هم حجر الأساس أو الطرف الوحيد اللي يمثل الشمال لا هم الطرف الوحيد اللي يمثل الإنقلاب الطرف الآخر اللي يمثل الشمال هم الطرفين اللي يمثلوا الشمال الحوثيين وبقايا المؤتمر في صنعاء والإخوان المسلمين بقيات نائب رئيس الجمهورية علي محسن الأحمر في مأرب مع بقايا الطرف الآخر من المؤتمر ومن يمثل الجنوب هو المجلس الانتقالي مع المؤتمر الجامع الحضرمي وهم طرفين متناغمين جوال هناك هذا واحد احنا نقول لكم من الواقع نختصر في جانب هذا الطرفي الانقلاب الجانب الاخر نجاح التحالف او الاماراتيين فشلوا في مأرب لان الاخوان المسلمين ينظروا ان الاماراتيين لا أنا بعطي تعقيب من معلش لا ما نحن لأنه وقتنا يضيق طيب عدنا نص دقيقة أرجو عدنا نص دقيقة إذا في سؤال تفضل لا بعطيك تعقيب من الواقع لو سمحت الإخوان المسلمين ينظروا للإمارات أنها حاملة اللواء العلمانية في فتمت خيانة فيهم سوري نجحوا, نجحوا في تأسيس قوة في حضرموت أنا مضطر أقاطعك عفوا لأنه عم ناخذ أسئلة فقط لأنه في جمهور كبير معلش اسمح لي أعطينا نص دقيقة لا لا معلش بسأل فيها هذا هذا سؤال في سؤال أعطيني السؤال أرجوك هل هذا بيكون نجاح أم فشل في عملية تأسيس قوة النخبة الحضرمية التي تحارب الإرهاب إلى الآن من قبل بدعم التحالف أوكي شكرا أم أم غونا تيك One more question right there at the beginning of the row, and then keep going round, and I'll come to the people yeah. later on. We're, we've got quite a list now. Yeah. Please. Uh, my question is about this pers the personalized uh, relations in politics, in the politics of the Arab world and Saudi Arabia in particular. But I mean, we are seeing that also American politics is actually very personalized, especially in the last sort of two years when the, uh, you know, the, uh, brother, the son-in-law gets involved, etc. So my question is, um, you know, in Saudi Arabia and its relation with Yemen, before it was Prince Sultan who used to handle the relationship. But after his death, it seems that the Saudi leadership had become bewildered and not being able to actually continue uh, uh, its sponsorship of tribal groups or of uh, military, of Ali Abdullah Saleh, or the, the whole of the Yemeni scene. It lost its relation with its clients in Yemen. Hence, it was forced to go into this military strike that destroyed the country and precipitated a humanitarian crisis. So, so at the moment, uh, what, what is Saudi Arabia doing with Hadi? Is Hadi a hostage, like Saudi Arabia now has become uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the capital of uh, holding okay. Arab uh, presidents? Is Hadi a hostage in, in Riyadh? So we've got two questions so far for Mustafa on Yemen. Let's, let's take those. Uh, the first was a comment, so I will, it's his own view. So. Uh, but to answer the, uh, the question here about the relations of the Saudi government with the Yemeni that you uh, described as clients, uh, I, I remember very well because I was involved in the Saudi-Yemeni borders the negotiations when uh, Prince Al King Abdullah was still a crown prince. And one of the, uh, one of the conditions of President, uh, late President Saleh to sign the uh, borders agreement was that the allowances that were paid by these, what is called the special committee that was chaired by Prince Sultan, and then chaired by Prince Naif, and then by Prince Mohammed bin Naif, and it's now revived anyhow. But that was the condition of uh, President Saleh to sign the Borders Agreement, that the allowances that were paid to the clients should be cut. And, that, and he had a pledge from King Abdullah that the Saudis will never conspire against him. And that was his, the two, and this is why uh, King Abdullah came to his rescue in 2011. 
and this is why he took care of him after the assassination attempt that took place in 2011 too. So, well, the Saudis, or the Saudi government, always used this, uh, these procedures to buy alliances or allegiances in Yemen, but unfortunately, since uh, 2001, when the borders agreement was signed, these relations were cut, and this is what I said at the beginning, that the air campaign started with no allies in, in town because they have all stopped to be paid. There was, they had no, no, uh, no appetite to work for the Saudis anymore because they will not, the tribes will not work for free. And this is what made the Saudi made, make a, uh, the uh, greater mistake. They started to pay the arrears for the last 10 years to the tribe that have, been, have not been paid, so that to, to regain their loyalty to the Saudis. And unfortunately, it did not work. And this is what we are witnessing now. Thank you. I've got Karim, the young man at the back. Uh, put your hand up, please. And then there's two more gentlemen I see. And I'm going to take all three, because we've got a few minutes left. Go ahead. Uh, Karim Gerges. Um, so we know how uh, Egyptian uh, presidents are uh, scared or rather paranoid of uh, internal challenge um, from military uh, to their uh, rule. So my question is, uh, do you see that any rising based on these miscalculations from Sisi, do you see any credible rising challenge from the military uh, to, his, uh, to him? And do you see that the West um, is, uh, would support that challenge based on Egypt's uh, like recent engagement, more engagement with Russia on, on the nuclear projects and uh, bases in, uh, in the West? Let's take that on Egypt, unless anyone, the other two gentlemen, either of you are asking questions about Egypt specifically? Okay, so let's take this, Michelle, and then. Right, well, so the, there's, um there's a lot of speculation, you know, in Egypt right now about this question, about the degree of support to President Sisi from the military and other actors within the security state. And we saw this, this curious episode recently of Ahmed Shafiq, the, uh, you know, a former uh, uh, military officer and prime minister of Egypt who was in the UAE and, um, and then was, you know, once he announced he uh, wanted to run against Sisi, was basically deported uh, by the UAE to Egypt and now is in this strange sort of, uh, seems to be a, 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 a kind of a, I don't, we can't call it a house arrest. It's another one of those hotel arrests, it seems. Um, you know, and it's, uh, you know, unclear whether he's going to be allowed to run. And there is speculation about this. Look, you know, the, the, the Egyptian military and security state uh, is, is very opaque, so it's very difficult to know what's going on. We really didn't know until after the 2011 uprising that the military was definitely against the succession of Gamal Mubarak, right? I mean, it became clear when they sided uh, with, with the demonstrators against Mubarak that, that that was about stopping the Gamal Mubarak succession. So I think we won't know until, you know, after it happens. Um, I, you know, my guess would be that the military would, would probably stick with President Sisi and support him for another term unless they felt that he had become too much of a, a liability in various ways. I mean, their primary concern is going to be keeping the state intact and keeping enough uh, Egyptian public support for the for the military itself uh, that that's going to be their their concern right and so I think they would they would turn against Sisi if they felt he'd become too much of a liability but as I said there's a lot of speculation right now um, in in Cairo about that I think a, a lot of this is going to become clearer in the next month or two when either either President Sisi will um, you know announce publicly that he's running for another term and that his campaign will begin and so forth or it won't thanks I've got Two questions um, just there, yes, and then there's another gentleman further forward. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Tabet. Uh, I have a question for uh, Joe Bahwood. You, you said that uh, Saudi Arabia didn't swallow its uh, setback uh, in Lebanon. Do you have any information about it? And uh, what do you think uh, could be 
uh, its reaction given uh, the reluctance of the United States to back it on this uh, issue. Thanks, and can we pass the microphone two rows forward, please? Three rows forward. If you could put your arm up. Yeah, thanks. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Riyad Tabba. I'm uh, Mr. Plipotentiaire diplomat, ex-diplomat. Uh, the global think tank, Karenji, for me, is no longer think tank. It is steps ahead. The analysis now is rational, logical, effective. And there is, I'm afraid, the conflicting party always find in such analysis persuasive ideas to stick to their stance. A word on edge, what to expect in 2018. Can I expect from Karenji to work on a formula for a solution in Yemen, as well as... Can I ask you to present this as a question addressed to one of the panelists? Can I expect 2018 from the panelists and other uh, researchers at Karenji to work on a formula so that it would be persuasive to the conflicting party to search for a solution rather than sticking to their point of view. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we do try, but um, what I'll do is I'll turn this around as a question, plus both questions that we've just had um, to my fellow panelists, starting with Joe, I'll work in reverse order. Um, you know, the, the direct question to you about, uh, you know, is, is this just a temporary ceasefire in Lebanon, uh, as it were, and then the broader question of going back to 2018 and, you know, solution building. I mean, one sort of 30 second soundbite from each of you on that. Uh, to my good friend, uh, Brahim Tabit. Uh, no, Brahim, I don't have any information. I, I, can, I can swear. Uh, but I have, I mean, I, like, like most of us, I read, uh, I read signs, I, I try to follow tracks and, and trends and etc. I mean, I, I, I think logically you can't expect uh, a rational, supposedly rational actor to have uh, tried something that was bold, that was in fact um, toppling the table on a certain equilibrium in Lebanon and wanting to isolate uh, Hezbollah like, in fact, they wanted to isolate the Houthis with the, the, the returning of, of Ali Abdullah Saleh before his killing, and then be faced with a series of, let's say, resistances that were due to the mishandling of the issue more than the structural thing, in fact. It had to do with probably the, also the, the international surface of the person concerned, Saad Hariri, that we have seen here this morning, and then uh, backtrack for a while, but in fact the structural aim is still there. Now what I agree on, uh, and this is maybe that, would, uh, that could save Lebanon for a while, is that for the same reasons that Prime Minister Hariri displayed this morning, uh, uh, I mean the necessity of keeping stability in Lebanon, at least because there's a kind of international problem which is called the refugees, Probably there's a limit or a cap to this kind of Saudi strategy, but I think that below that, and uh, I'll bite that, uh, other attempts will be made uh, in order to reach the same goal, which is in a way more or less isolate Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now, I don't know at all what are the tools for that, but I know that, uh, I don't know, but I, I expect that this trial will be, will be tried uh, be tried again, and this is my bet for 2018. If I Thanks. have to end on that note, thank you. I'll come to you second in that order. The, 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 the formula to uh, solve the Yemeni uh, crisis would be uh, is very simple. I mean, you have to bring the negotiate the, the powers to the table. But on the other side, we have to know that the Yemen war is becoming a domestic game in Saudi Arabia itself. Uh, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, thought that Yemen would be his legitimacy to become a crown prince, then soon maybe a king. 
and he, he, he started it with him when he was a Minister of Defense and as a Deputy Crown Prince. He took the decision and he convinced his father about it. Unfortunately, it did not work. Now, this, the coalition, they claim that they control 80, 85% of the land, but they did not continue the uh, phrase to the land that it only has 20% of the population, while the other 15% of the land has the other 80% uh, of the population. So the equation is disturbed. MBS will not stop the war, and he made it very clear until he has a very clear victory, which I don't see coming very soon. Thanks. Michelle. So I guess it falls. I guess it falls to me to say what, what we can count on Carnegie for. So. Uh, <laughs> in 2018, if there's anything to add. Yeah. Look, I, I mean. Uh, I think what you know what we try to do at Carnegie is to uh, look at these issues and not to shy away from the difficult implications of them, right? Uh, and not to just paint a happy picture, you know, as we as we look at these issues and say, you know, inshallah khair, but uh, you know that that we really try to shed light on on difficult aspects and to bring different points of view to the table. I mean, you're going to hear from our other colleagues from from Moscow and so forth uh, later this afternoon. So um, you know, regarding Yemen, I mean, I, I quite agree that that this is one that desperately needs um, that desperately needs good solutions. But I also think in in looking at those solutions and in making recommendations, as we often do at Carnegie and other think tanks, make recommendations to the, the governments in the various places where we work of how they could contribute to um, how they could contribute to better solutions. But we have to continue to speak honestly about as we understand it, how those parties see their interests and what's motivating them. So that sounds like, I don't know about Egypt, but for Carnegie, we're going to push hard in 2018. <laughs> Thanks so much to all of you. Thanks to the panelists for a very interesting discussion.